Evening, everybody. Hello and welcome to tonight's session of Ready for Pre-K. Before we get started, uh, there are a few housekeeping items that I want to go over with the group. We're using Zoom, as you can see, to host tonight's session. Throughout the session, we invite you to enter your questions and comments into the Q&A. This session will be recorded and it will be posted on the DCPS YouTube. Um, so for that reason, we have gone ahead and turned off your camera feature for all the guests. If you do need to, uh, tech support during tonight's session, you can feel free to use the chat. I'm really excited about this session for tonight and I hope that you are too. Before we get started there, oops, excuse me. Um, so we are offering simultaneous interpretation in Spanish. I'm going to have a quick pause for an announcement from our interpreter, Evelyn. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Awesome, good evening everyone. Buenas noches a todos, solamente quería dejarles saber que seré la intérprete del día de hoy para que usted pueda escuchar esta sesión en su idioma. Si puede, se está utilizando su computadora, puede ver la parte del globo que dice interpretación escoger el icono de español para que usted pueda escucharme al mismo tiempo que la presentación se lleve a cabo. Por favor, apague su micrófono para que pueda escuchar claramente. Asimismo, si está utilizando el dispositivo, eh, su teléfono en este caso, puede ir a la sección de más de M-O-R-E con los tres puntos y así a hacer un clic en el, la sección que dice el lenguaje de interpretación. Al momento que le haga un clic en esa parte, puede seleccionar la parte de español, apagar su micrófono donde dice silencio y así puede escucharme automáticamente. Thank you so much, Evelyn. We like to start all of our Ready for Pre-K sessions with some general community agreements for our time together. We're committed to making this a safe forum where everyone feels safe, welcome, and respected. So we ask that you be kind, be patient, and be open to the experience. Let's get started. So my name is Lauren Brown, and I'm the Director of Family Services for the Early Childhood Education Division. Cheryl, would you like to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Cheryl Olson. I'm the Deputy Chief of the Early Childhood Division. Send it over to Robin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robin Jones. I identify as she, her, and I am the Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Ms. Massey? Hi, my name is Sarah Massey, and I'm a mixed age pre-K teacher at Plummer Elementary. All right, I'll take it from here. Um, good afternoon again, everyone. It's really so nice to see um, so many people on this call this evening. Um, if you're joining us tonight, it probably means that you have a little one at home who will be starting pre-K with us uh, this fall. And we are so excited to welcome your child and your family to our classrooms um, in just a little under a month now. Um, after a few very unusual and challenging years, we're really looking forward to what I hope will be a much more typical and very exciting school year. Uh, so this is really a great time um, to start pre-K. Uh, our goal tonight is to provide you with some information about what children's experiences are like in our pre-K programs and what you can do over the next month to anticipate and get ready for the start of the, uh, start of the school year in a month, um, both for you and for your child. Uh, we'll share an overview and some general information so that you can have as much information as possible before September 1st. And of course, we will leave some time at the end for question and answers, but please feel free to chime in anytime throughout the chat. Uh, my colleagues who are also on this call will be keeping an eye on that and, and try, to, try to respond to as many questions as we go as possible. All righty. All right, so before we jump in, our Chancellor Farabee recently had the opportunity to spend some time with Scribbles, who, uh, if you don't know Scribbles, Scribbles is our adorable, ready for pre-K mascot at DCPS. Um, and so they had a chance to visit uh, some of our amazing pre-K classrooms. So we'll take a moment to take a quick peek at that. Hi, Chancellor. 
Scribbles, why are you outside here in the hallway? I'm nervous about pre-K. It's okay to be nervous. Why don't you join me and talk with some of our pre-K experts? Okay. Good to have you, Scribbles. Oh, hey, friend. <laughs> How do you feel now? I feel great! Will you be ready for pre-K? I sure will. All right, so hopefully that short little video gives you just a quick, very, very quick glimpse into our classrooms and a sense of how much fun our kids are having in the classrooms. Um, we can put the link to this video in the chat also. So if you have a chance and you haven't done so already, go ahead and, and show your little one um, that video. And hopefully that will help them to, to build some excitement for the start of school as well. All righty, we can go to the next slide. All right, so real quick before we really jump in, um, this is how we'll spend our time together over the next about 40 minutes. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, things that you can do for yourself and for your child to help get ready for the start of school. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at some components of the pre-K day, uh, including things that uh, DCPS has done and individual schools have done over the last couple of years to make sure, sure that our schools are healthy and safe places for everyone. And we'll talk about ways that you can continue to build your child's skills at home over the summer and into the fall and through the school year. I uh, will also share some strategies to help, uh, help you work with your child over the next month to help them feel ready and prepared and excited for that first day of school. And we'll share a few quick health and safety reminders before we go. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have some time for questions at the end as well. All righty. Okay, so before we jump in and really spend some time talking about your little one, uh, we're going to start with uh, talking about you for just a minute. So for many kids and families, as you probably know, starting pre-K can feel really overwhelming. Um, and you yourself may be feeling a bit anxious about what to expect and how to best prepare your child and yourself and what you can do to help ensure this transition goes smoothly. I think starting pre-K has always been a challenging and somewhat stressful experience sometimes for parents. And I think especially after these last few years uh, with everything that, um, that we've seen and everything that we've gone through in this country, it, it can be um, a time of sometimes height, heightened anxieties, but there's some really simple things that you can do to take care of yourself in this process and also to make sure that your child is ready and excited and set up for success. So whether you've done this before with an older child or whether this is your first go round, uh, starting pre-K can bring up a range of emotions uh, for you as parents and caregivers. Um, if you're feeling brave, we'd love to invite you to take a moment to unmute um, or comment in the chat. How are you doing? Um, how are you feeling about this transition? What are some of the emotions that are coming up for you? Um, and as parents and caregivers getting ready to send your one little uh, off, li your little one off to pre-K, what is front of mind for you? So we'll go ahead um, and give you just a minute. I see a hand raised. I see some excitement as well. Uh, Deanna, I think I saw a hand raised. Do you want to go ahead and come off mute and tell us what's on your mind? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited. Uh, my son is two. He'll be three. And so this is a, a big transition. He's had only the nanny since COVID. And um, so this will be different for us. The other thing is I'm having a baby in two weeks. So oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I'm actually worried. Um, I'm not going to lie about the COVID piece of it because he would then be in school, which could be a liability to the newborn. So I do have some anxiety over that. Um, but aside from that, I'm excited about the experience for him. Understood. Understood. Yep. And we will definitely spend a few moments talking about COVID um, a, a little bit later this evening, and hopefully we can get some of your some of your questions answered. Uh, I see another hand up, I think. Corinthia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, my son will be turning three, so I'm actually excited and looking forward to him going um, to school because he's energetic and loves learning. But um, one of the things I'm concerned about is that he is a uh, full of energy boy. So I'm just worried about um, how he'll be able to redirect his energy into learning and how school will um, engage him with that. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Uh, and we do have one of our amazing uh, pre-K teachers on the line this evening. So she'll have a chance to weigh in as well. Uh, but our, our teachers are very, you know, all, all of our pre-K, this, this will not be and it won't be in any trouble at all, but can completely understand, um, understand your anxiety. Uh, thanks, Josh? Thank you guys for hosting this. Um, there's two things really at the forefront of my mind. And the first is there's been a lack of communication from the school that we got into. And I have no idea what to expect or even items to buy, prepare my son and my family uh, for day one of class. Uh, he's going into pre-K, uh, pre-K three. And then the second piece was, I didn't even know that the after-school programs uh, applications became available when they did. Again, because there's no communication from the school, but I just didn't know in general. And I found out about applying for after-school from another parent that I ran into at a park. They said, oh, have you signed up? I'm like, no, and sorry, week late. And the after-school program was filled by the time I got to sign up. And so I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen um, for my son and his care yep. when school day's over. Uh, yeah. And that's adding a little bit of stress. Okay. Yep. So thanks for coming. Uh, yep. I hear you. I understand. And so some of your questions we may be amp able to answer tonight, just in a general sense. We won't be talking about specific schools this evening, but we will be talking about in general practices across, um, across the district. And you are welcome to reach out to us. You'll see our email uh, a little bit later in this presentation, or you can go ahead and put information in the chat. Um, and for anybody who is really ha having a hard time um, getting in contact with the school, we can help facilitate that for you. Um, okay, okay, I see lots of, yep, lots of aftercare, lots of other, some excitement and some nervousness in the chat as well. So all of this is um, very typical and very understanding at the start of the school year. Um, and so before we go, go ahead any further, just reminder, we as adults really set the tone for our children. So even though you may have all kinds of emotions coming up for yourself and questions and anxieties, and you know, as we just heard in some, in some situations, maybe even some frustration, um, it's important to acknowledge your own emotions as you go through this, but making sure that um, you know, your child is hearing excitement and hearing positivity and things like that. We all know that they can sort of feed off our own emotions and things, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, so we'll be spending some more time uh, this evening talking about how you can, uh, how you can support them and, and um, get them ready as well. I think we can go ahead to the next slide. All right. All right. So before we jump into the details of, of the pre-K day and what that looks like, we'll start with some tips for introducing the idea of starting pre-K or starting school um, for your child. I know many of you probably have already been doing this and been talking about this for a while. Um, and we'll share some helpful strategies that can support them uh, in understanding what going to pre-K means. Uh, we know that some kids are very, very familiar with this process already. You may, they may have older siblings, and so they may be very used to going to school for a drop-off and pick-up and school events. Um, and others may not have any idea what school is yet or, or been in the building, um, and they, especially if they've been home with a caregiver um, up until now. So our kids are really coming at this uh, from lots of different places. We can go ahead to the next slide. All right, so preparing for the transition. So the first thing, obviously, sharing the news. You've probably done this already. If not, uh, you might wanna think about when is the right time for some children. Uh, they like a lot of advanced warning, a lot of advanced preparation and conversation and things like that. Um, for other kids, if they tend to be, um, have a little bit more increased anxiety or things like that, it may be okay to wait until just a couple weeks before school to really start those conversations. So really think about what you think is, is best um, for your child. Um, and then again, thinking about how the conversations that, that they're absorbing with you as you talk to um, other adults, um, other adults in your home, other adults in your community and things like that. Um, and so think about when you can set aside some time to talk to them about this exciting um, change and everything that's gonna come with it. Um, talk to them about what will be the same and what will be, uh, what will be different. I mean, we all, when something unknown is coming, we all tend to associate it with things that we already know and already have experienced and children are no different. Um, and so they will, they, will want, they, will, they will be reassured if you're able to connect this with things that they already know. So for example, if they're already 
in a childcare setting or something like that, or maybe they go to grandma's during the day while you go to work or something like that. Uh, talk about some of the similarities, um, some things that are the same. Your new school will have a playground just like you have at wherever they happen to be now. And there'll be grownups there to take care of you just like now. Um, some things that may be different is there may be more children there or it may be a bigger building um, or there may be two teachers instead of one teacher or things like that. Just start to think about what's the same and what's different and how you can share that information with your child. Um, also, under, talking about the drop off. So um, obviously the drop off in the morning is can be one of the most stressful times of day. So really helping your child prepare for that and what that's going to look like. Um, if your child does go to a child care setting now uh, or another preschool setting, you can say things like, you know, just like now, I'll say goodbye to you in the morning. If you have a routine that supports that, remind them that this will be the same as they go into the new place. So they'll, they'll, they'll know that there'll be something familiar um, and they'll understand what's coming. Um, definitely show them pictures um, of the new school, drive by, visit the playground on the weekends or in the evenings this month. So they really become familiar and ideally really start to feel like it's their own. So they'll start to feel like this is, this is going to be their new, their new home away from home as well. Um, this could be a great activity to do over the next several weeks. Most of the playgrounds should be open to the public. Um, on weekends and in the evenings. Um, if not, you can call your school to see when the playground uh, should be open for a visit. Most schools should also be hosting um, summer play dates. Some have gotten those started already and many have play dates coming over the coming weeks. And so that's a great opportunity for you to visit the playground, visit the school um, with your child, meet some of the school staff, meet other classmates and things like that. Um, and taking pictures of your visit to the building so they can look at it again and again. So take pictures when you visit the building with your child um, as they're on the swings or climbing structure or things like that. Um, and then maybe even encourage your child to show those pictures to people they love, grandparents, neighbors, um, other loved ones again. So again, they're starting to associate the school building uh, with something positive and something familiar. And again, starting to feel like it's their, their home away from home. Uh, okay, next slide. I'll send that over to Robin. Great, thank you. So, so what happens during the day um, as your child is beginning um, their school journey? So a typical pre-K three and pre-K four day is um, a variety of different activities. Um, we're gonna go into each of these in a little bit more detail, talk about what they look like, talk about um, the skills that they, they um, support and then how to prepare your child for what to expect next so that they feel confident as they enter their school. So taking a look at the schedule, you'll get a sense of what it looks like uh, in a typical day. And um, I just wanna point out a couple of things that you'll notice the word specials. That is your arts, PE, music. Each school has a different set of designated specials that your child will go to. And the majority of them happen in the classroom, except for PE where they'll go actually to the gym or outdoor and sometimes library. If they're checking out books, they'll go to the library. All other specials are going to be happening in the classroom. And these teachers are really um, using uh, age appropriate and developmentally appropriate activities to engage your child. And it's this is one of the ways for our high energy children to really get up and moving, um, experiencing the music, experiencing uh, full body art, things like that. So there's definitely opportunities for the high energy throughout the day. You'll also notice that we have um, center-based play, outdoor play, very important that we have play throughout the day so your child won't be missing out on those key opportunities for play. Now, each school's daily schedule will look a little bit different depending on their schedule, their special schedule, and when they can go outdoors and lunch. But most programs will follow something like this, but maybe not in this particular order. Most of our programs use creative curriculum, which is really a centered-based inquiry-based program. We have a few Montessori programs throughout the district, but still, they're still kind of following this same schedule. So going on to that morning arrival, the first part of the day is obviously the arrival and it's a very important part of the day and um, to, to transition into the school. And it's one that we get a lot of questions about, understandably so, uh, parents, and children really, parents and children really wanna know what to expect during this transition. So typically, um, pre-K children arrive at school between 8.15 and 8.45, depending on the program or if they attend before care. And traditionally, 
pre-pandemic, parents walk their children to the classroom where they sign in, they help their children put things away in their cubby, they say goodbye, you have an opportunity to engage with the teacher, share anything about the morning or the evening before that you'd like to share with the teacher that would be helpful, um, and how your children are feeling, and then children are invited to come and eat breakfast in the classroom if they like, or there's opportunities to play or draw, or look at books, and just engage with other children as everyone is arriving and finishing eating. Now that may look a little di bit different as we begin 22, 23. We don't know what, what that opening is gonna look like at this point, if, they're, if families are gonna be into, invited into the classrooms at all the schools. We're gonna talk a little bit more about some of these different um, options that schools have later in the session. But, but it's really important that you use this time, as Cheryl said earlier, to like have a routine. As you see, they're doing high fives here. The, 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 family members doing a high five with the kids and you're gonna have a great day. Um, we do obviously expect, go, on, go ahead, we can go into the next one, uh, next slide. The first couple of days, couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months, there's gonna, there could be tears as we drop off. Um, this is new, this is a new building. There. Are, there are older children in the building. We're dropping them off with adults. We don't know those first couple of weeks. And so it's expected to see a couple of tears from children and, and maybe a couple of family members too might have some tears as they drop them off at school. So there are some ways that, you know, Cheryl has mentioned a couple of ways that you can really get ready for that first day of those drops off in the first days of schools. Um, just a couple of additional ones. Most of our schools will be offering play dates in the school at the school, and this will also help with the school communication, find the play dates that schools are offering. Um, and that's an opportunity for children and families and teachers to meet before the start of the school year. So I think you can find those play dates by checking out the school website. And then you'll have a chance to meet the teacher in person, meet some other children so that they have that friendship and those relationships already built. And that's gonna go a long way in helping children feel more comfortable in the first day. It's also reassuring to see that familiar face. So if they saw them at a play date and had a really fun time playing with them at a play date and then they see them in the classroom, that makes that transition into the classroom a little easier. Another way we can prepare for that morning arrival is to participate in the family visits, whether it's virtually or in person. Um, many of our programs will offer that home visits prior to the start of school. This can be done, um, like I said, either virtually or in person. It it doesn't have to be in your home. It could be at a public location like the playground or the library. And this is really just an opportunity, a relaxed opportunity for you to interact with your teacher and possibly the other adult in the classroom, the paraprofessional on a one-to-one -one basis and really get to know each other and they can learn about your child, your child's strengths and their likes and their interests. It really is um, a, a great opportunity for that exchanging of information. And lastly, as the first day of school approaches, practice that daily routine, as Cheryl mentioned, and think about creating that special goodbye with your child um, as they go to school. Have a plan for having a plan for this transition is really important for both you and the child. This might be something that ritual could be something like see you later, alligator, after a while, crocodile, or a hug or a high five anything that's meaningful for you and your child. And then practice it before school. Practice it before the first day of school and in advance. And then remind your child, after we do this, then you're gonna stay with your teachers. I'll wave goodbye, but don't worry. I'll be back at the end of the day and you can tell me all about what you did at school. Um, Miss Massey, would you be able to come off mic and share a little bit about some of the drop-off experiences that you've had and what's been really helpful? Absolutely. Um, for those who joined late, my name is Sarah Massey, and I'm a pre-K teacher at Plummer Elementary. Um, last year, we were, as teachers, a little nervous because we were, I've been teaching in DCPS almost 10 years, and I was used to having parents come straight into the classroom, and I didn't know how, you know, the children would respond to you know, drop off on the playground. That was the routine we had at our school. We, we met the families on the playground and then we escorted the children into the building, um, school staff did. But we used play dates, we used the community visits and community outreach before school started. 
Um, and, you know, we made sure to touch base with families to start building relationships early. So on that first day of school, we weren't strangers to children or their, you know, or their parents, right? Because nothing is more nerve wracking than leaving your baby with someone that you've never spoken to before and not getting to see what the room looks like that they go into. Um, we are also, you know, working on photos of the classroom to share those with parents. And in some opportunities, we have a classroom set up during a play date so parents can come in and see, oh, this is what it looks like. This is where my child's going to use the bathroom. Um, and then one other thing that we did that isn't listed here is we asked all of our families for family photos um, in advance and we took those photos and we hung them in the children's cubbies so the first thing they saw once they got into the classroom um, and hung up their book bag was a picture of their family so if they were a little emotional and a little bit sad you know saying goodbye the the very first experience they had walking in the classroom door they saw their family was there and their family was represented um, and most most or if not all pre-K teachers want, they don't want to be strangers to you on the first day of school. So if you haven't heard from them yet, it's okay. It's only August 1st. Um, some of us haven't even gotten our class list yet. We're biting at, you know, chomping at the bit to get them too. Um, so as soon as your teacher has their class list, I am sure they will be reaching out to you um, to let you know about play dates to let you know about home visits. You may be wondering why does pre-K start September 1st? I saw that question in the chat instead of the Monday, like everybody else. It's because we have those three days as a part of a transition to build relationships with families, if not starting that earlier. Um, I think that sums it up pretty nicely. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Massey. All right, so after the arrival and breakfast, we tend to typically move into a morning meeting. It's sometimes called opening circle or opening group or circle time. And this is really just a community building opportunity where children and teachers greet each other. Um, we get excited. We talk about the plans for the day and what we're gonna do and we get excited about that. There's sometimes a focus question that's related to our um, inquiry, our creative curriculum study. So it could, you know, there's a question that we start to engage in conversation and get children's thoughts. It's an opportunity to engage in movement and music and um, some other whole, whole group learning activities. But this is just a short time, like we're together, we're all here and we're really glad you're here. So it's a, it's a great, it's an important part of the day. It's um, so it's important that children get to experience that. That so coming in late, if they miss that, it could cause a little, um, a little, uh, make the transition into the classroom a little more difficult because this is a time where they really come together and they celebrate each other. We can go ahead into the next slide, and then we go. Um, into center time and small groups. What does that look like? What happens during that? Our pre-K classrooms are really designed to support that active hands-on play and learning. Again, most three-year-olds have a lot of energy and it's gonna be a transition from being on the move all day to having to focus for short periods of time. But then we build in these opportunities to go into learning centers. Um, the types of learning, learning centers are listed on the one side of the slide. And then each day, children are able to choose which center they'd like to go and play in. And in those centers, they get to direct their own play and learning. So the materials are there. Most of the time, the materials are open-ended and, and have an explore exploratory um, opportunity. And the children can go in and engage with their peers and with the materials. Now, teacher, the teacher and the assistant teacher engage and play with the children. Sometimes they'll be asking them questions about what they're doing. Sometimes they'll be pushing in and, and adding new information to the child's play so the child can expand their play and just really incorporating learning into play. Teachers are frequently adding new materials to the centers to provide children with new experiences and to keep them interesting and engaged. So frequently teachers lead small groups also during this time. So they'll pull two or three children to come out of play for a short amount of time and engage on something um, that is more skill-driven. 
and it gives these small groups give children the opportunity to practice or hone in on specific skills that they might be working on. For example, a teacher might pull a group of three children who are all working on recognizing the same letter of the alphabet or who were absent for a lesson that was taught the day before. And then once they're done, once they're done with that really short, small, explicit small group instruction, they move and return back into play. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, I have a one-year-old who is very enthusiastic about pre-K, so you may hear him um, give his two Why don't we take a moment and think a little bit about the developmental skills that children will need uh, or will use, excuse me, in some of the activities that were previously mentioned, like the morning meeting, center time, small group work, what skills can we be building and encouraging at home that might support some of these activities? Um, and please, anyone feel free to put it in the chat or come off mute, share what you can do at home that would support. Oh, we have a great one, SEL. So social emotional um, learning, if you wanna expand a little bit about that, for those who might not know, that would be awesome too. Um, what other ideas do folks have? Sharing, taking turns, transitioning from activity to activity. I love that, that is awesome. That's something I'm trying to do already now too. Potty training, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. That's a wonderful skill that if your child is ready for, you are welcome to begin that process. But just a reminder that your students do not have to be potty trained to come to our pre-K program, which we think is um, an awesome highlight. So we love that. If your kiddo is ready and you're ready, um, you know, get that party started. But we don't want you to fear or put too much pressure energy on that this summer if your kiddo is just not quite ready. Parents reading DC's early learning standards. Oh, you are, are do we have a teacher? Is this a teacher? Um, that's awesome. You can get familiar with that. Reading texts that focus on going to school. Oh, we love that. So one of the things that you'll certainly see in your child's classroom and something that will likely be encouraged by your child's teachers, just reading books and having social stories about the experiences that they will soon be having. This gets them primed and excited and familiar with some of the experiences that they're gonna have. Um, thank you for those ideas. Let's transition to the next slide. Okay, so we know that social emotional skills as was mentioned in the chat are a crucial part of our young children's development. A strong social emotional foundation can support a smoother transition into school, which will allow for um, you know, the ability to learn and play alongside with others. Many kiddos um, coming into pre-K and even kindergarten for that matter, especially in these last several years, have never been in a care setting outside of the home or in a much smaller environment. So it's an adjustment that we know for ourselves and for them. And our priority is always to meet children where they are. So we want you to know that our teachers have an experience welcoming students who have come from a breadth of experiences prior to coming into the classroom. They spend a lot of time in the beginning of the year working on just establishing a relationship and a sense of community and also setting expectations and reminding our kiddos of those expectations as, as the days go on. Um, there are things that we can start practicing at home to get them ready. Many of the things that you already mentioned, establishing a consistent routine and with pre-K in mind. Um, children find comfort and safety in routine and predictability. So, I know we've said it a million times, but that is really very powerful. Remember that um, establishing a routine is important for adults in the household as well. So if getting to school on time is gonna be a significant change for how your mornings go, consider starting that kind of timeline a couple weeks before school starts over the summer, rather than waiting for you know, that first week of school. I think this will help not only the kiddo get used to it, but also you know, the adults in the household get used to that transition. We also wanna practice identifying, naming, and handling big emotions. 
the transition to school can bring up a lot of big feelings for little ones and for adults. Um, we wanna help your child recognize and name their own emotions and feelings of that they're having and also that of others. So being able to communicate how you feel, developing awareness for how others feel, those are both essential skills in creating friendships and getting along with others in the classroom and, and for the rest of life, really. Um, so we wanna practice handling those big emotions by taking deep breaths, going on a walk, counting to five, you know, cuddling a stuffed animal and just kind of taking a beat. And those are all things that many of you I'm sure are doing right now, but that would be great to, to start in the summer. We also want to model and practice positive social skills at home. So even if there's no other children in the house, you can still model and reinforce these social skills as adults. So that could be practicing manners um, while interacting with the child or other adults in the household. May I please have that? Um, practicing taking turns. So may I have a turn with your toy or can you share with you know, your brother or sister, grandma, neighbor? Um, or for example, you can do this during dinner time. So first I'll stir the soup, then you can have a turn stirring the soup. You can do things like play board games or collaborative activities that might involve kind of doing something, waiting, taking a turn, sharing with others. And as we mentioned before, and, and I see in the chat, folks are really excited about play dates. So of course, someone's organized by your school, but you know, in the community uh, with other kids in your neighborhood, visit a playground, spa, splash park, a library, wherever your child will have an opportunity to interact with others. And this will give your kiddo an opportunity, uh, the chance again, to have some peer to peer play, build their confidence and start working on some of those social skills. to the next slide. So um, language and communication skills are another area of growth and development that we know supports children's learning, their cognition, their ability to engage positively with others. When we think about um, what skills children utilize during the school day, communication and language are absolutely key. There are so many ways that we can also support this. So if you remember nothing else, we hope that you remember to talk to your child as much as possible. So that means engaging them in back, to force, back and forth conversations so that they can learn kind of the rules of language, how to carry on a conversation with multiple exchanges. So not just, um, you know, sort of you giving directives, but, you know, offering a, the start of, of a conversation, waiting for them to return and kind of doing that ping pong back and forth. We also encourage you to just think out loud. Put words to what you're doing or thinking and why you're doing them. Thinking out loud supports children's language and cognition. So it could be as simple as, I'm feeling a bit frustrated about all of this traffic as you're you know, on your way uptown or downtown. I think I'll take some deep breaths to help me calm down. Or when you're cooking. First, I'm gonna add the noodles. Then I'm gonna set a timer for 10 minutes so that I know when it's done. Just talking through simple everyday tasks that you're doing at home will be have such an impact for your kiddo. And then we wanna encourage you to ask your child open-ended questions or questions that require more than a one word response. So what do you think might happen next in the movie? Tell me about your picture. How else could we solve this problem? A really great tool um, that I use in my house is are those, you know, just board books without any words. And so there's a, of course, now I can't remember the name of it, but one of our favorite books that we read is something about, um, oh, the gorilla in the zoo. Anyway, there's no words on that book really. Um, and so one of the things that you can do is just kind of open it up, ask them what they think is happening. What made you think that? What do you think is gonna happen next? Those are, um, would be awesome things that you can do in your home right away. Another thing we encourage is to use big words. So the more vocabulary that your child is familiar with, the more connections that they can make and the better they will be at articulating their ideas. Um, and then lastly, just practice expressing ideas, feelings, and needs. So encourage your child to use words to express themselves, their ideas and their needs. Being able to communicate these things to their teachers and peers is gonna help them to feel more confident, and more empowered and more able to get their needs met into the classroom. 
if, while they're in the classroom, excuse me. So now let's take another look um, at part of the pre-K day. Robin? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. And I love hearing your little one <laughs> practicing his language skills. <laughs> He's telling us all about good night, gorilla. <laughs> Yes, that's it. I could not think of it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So there are other times of the day. We've talked about the centers and, and kind of the instructional components of the day, but there are lots of other times in the days that parents and families have questions about and that are also equally important for developing those social and emotional skills and language skills that um, Lauren was talking about. So meal times tend to be one of those times where parents are like, what's happening? Well, how does that work at, when they're at school? And so when at school, children will engage in what we call family style meals. And that means essentially that uh, the children and the all, adults all sit and enjoy a conversation while eating. Family style meals encourages children to try new foods and learn healthy eating habits as they're talking about the food that everyone is having and just engaging in those conversations. Children will have washed their hands before and after the meals and all the surfaces will be sanitized and the teachers will serve the children individual portions of food rather than the communal serving dishes in most of our schools. So our Title I schools provide free breakfast and free lunch to all students. And our non-Title I schools, they offer the opportunity for children to purchase school lunches. Typically schools will post or send home copies of the school lunch menus for families. Alternatives are offered for children with dietary restrictions and parents can fill out their dietary restriction form at the school. And of course, families are welcome to send food from home for your child if you prefer. All meals that are served are prepared by the school. All the, um, excuse me, all the meals prepared by the school are peanut and tree nut free. So we don't have any of that. Um, need to worry about those allergies. And if there's other allergies present in the classroom, the teacher will inform the family so they know not to send those items in the school also. And plus there's a place in the classroom where the teacher keeps a list of all the um, allergies so that if for some reason there's a substitute teacher in the room or anything else, an another adult in the room during that time, they have access to that list of allergies so that we keep all of our children safe during this meal time. And then rest time. So, you know, many of our three-year-olds and four-year-olds are still napping during the day. They need that time to just kind of calm their bodies. Even if they're not sleeping, they just need that quiet time. So we usually have rest time after lunch. Our pre-K classrooms usually allow for 90 minutes of rest and our pre-K four allow for 60 minutes. Now, not every child naps. So those for those children who do not nap, they're provided with quiet activities to do during this time, such as puzzles, coloring materials, books. Um, sometimes there's a, a laptop, an, an iPad where they can get on and do um, academic or, or fun games. Um, Pre-K classrooms either have cots or mats for each child. They're usually labeled with the child's name so they get the same cot and mat. And they wipe down after each use. So they're sanitized and then put away. Um, and then while they're out, we are spacing them so that there's space between the children, um, at least two feet apart, and then usually placing them head to toe. You can send, parents and families are invited to send cozy blankets or a small pillow for your child to have during this time. And then after the nap, the personal items are then placed back in the child's cubby and sent home to be washed at the end of that week. And then restroom breaks. I know uh, Lauren, I talked about potty training and how it's not mandatory. So um, I'm sure you might be wondering about what this looks like when you have 16 children in the classroom, but we do wanna start by reminding you that being potty trained is not required to start school. Is it helpful? Of course, it is very helpful. But if your child isn't there yet, we'll help you through the process. Teachers will partner with you to ensure that um, we're doing a parallel process at home and at school. So if your child is not potty trained, you can send in wipes and pull-ups to school, but regardless about whether your, potty, your child is potty trained or not, um, it's important to send a clean change of clothing that they can keep in their cubby just in case, especially during those nap times. So we wanna make sure that they always have a change of clothing. Now, most of our classrooms have children's restrooms in the classroom that the children can access freely throughout the day. 
A few of our older schools have hallway restrooms with multiple stalls, and these programs tend to take the whole class to restroom breaks throughout the day. Um, we do expect the adults are in class, the adults in the classroom to maintain sight and sound supervision of all times. So a classroom with a restroom inside the classroom may not always shut the door all the way. It may have a half door. They may have a shower curtain up so that the adult can hear the if the child needs help when toileting, but still allow for that privacy. Now, if children need assistance, teachers and assistant teachers will help them by either talking them through what they need to do or and handing them the materials or physically assisting them if the child requires it, especially if they have physical and developmental delays. Teachers always use gloves in, in these instances and um, obviously they wash their hands afterwards just to ensure that we are staying safe and sanitary. I know that this um, using the restroom breaks in the bathroom weighs heavy on a lot of families' minds as they're sending, the, especially if it's your first child you're sending out to school. So I'm gonna ask Ms. Massey if she wants to share a little bit about how she partners with um, families in potty training. Um, absolutely. So first of all, if you are nervous because your child isn't quite there yet or hasn't really started having interest in potty training at all, it's okay. Um, especially if they're still two and they're turning three in September, it's okay. We have seen it before and our job as teachers is to be your partner. Um, when Robin said it's a parallel process, it truly is. Um, I have open communication with my parents and of the children in my classroom. Um, we track you know, potty training, we come up with, it, with the, whatever the routine is we're doing at school. Um, I want to make sure that it mirrors what you're doing at home and that we're using the same prompts. We're using the same language. Every family might, you, you might use slightly different um, terminology in the bathroom than I do. And I need to make sure that whatever you're saying, I'm saying too, so your child feels comfortable and safe and understands what we're doing. So um, the number one thing is communication. Back and forth. Number two is I always say, please send like two or three changes of clothes and just some play clothes, clothes you don't care about because um, we're doing this process together. And um, if your child needs it, I saw a question about needing a pull up at nap time. Let your child's teacher know this. We aren't quite making it, you know, through the night or, you know, we're let me know as your child's teacher and I'll wake them up halfway through nap to go to the bathroom real quick and then go lay back down because we're working on that process together. Um, some other materials that we use, we'll use social stories with kids that are potty training. We will use um, visual schedules for kids that might just need to see the steps on the wall. Um, we might use a timer that goes off, you know, every 20 or 30 minutes to say, hey, let's go try to go potty really quick. Um, so Whatever the routine is that you're doing at home, make sure you partner with the teacher. And in most cases, your teacher will have done this before and um, can offer you some tips on some things that may be working at school that you may want to try at home. So, and then there's a quick question about uniforms. The uniform policy varies school to school. Um, so that would be something you would check with your school about. But, you know, as far as sending in extra clothes, I always just suggest send old play clothes you don't care about because we paint, we get messy, you know, milk spills happen and potty accidents happen and it's pre-K. So if we're having fun, you might get a little bit dirty sometimes. Thank you, I love that. You might get a little bit dirty promise you're gonna get dirty. So that's great. Thank you, Ms. Massey, for sharing that. So um, as we're thinking about preparing children, we wanna also um, think about these self-help skills. Because when, you, when your child enters the classroom, you want them to feel confident. So things to consider about those self-help skills is like consider what meal times look like in, for you and your child at home and how the expectations might be different at school. For example, does your child use utensils and an open mouth cup, an open mouth cup regularly? Um, do they have practice sitting in a traditional chair to eat rather than being in a booster seat? Um, these are the things that you might gradually practice over the summer so that your child can develop some of these skills and again, move into the classroom confidently. 
We're going to talk about toy leaning again, just because it is that big one. Um, we've mentioned several times that it's not potty being potty trained is not a requirement, but there are definitely things that we can be working on now um, that are those self -help, self help skills that even if your child is or is not potty trained, for example, like taking up their pants or pulling up and on uh, or pulling on a pull up. Those are things that they, if they can, you can practice doing now so they can move into the classroom and do them um, in, independently. Um, washing hands after, the ch after changing or going to the restroom. Thinking about also if your child is potty trained, how could it be different in the school? For example, are they using a potty chair at home and now they're going to transition to the toilet? Um, are they used to pulling up their pants and pulling their pants up and down and zippering on their own. Again, knowing that zippering is a, is a skill that takes a lot of fine motor and teachers are always there to help and support, but these are things that we could start to practice. Um, and do they attempt to clean themselves? That's another thing you can start to practice over the summer as you're thinking about moving into the school, uh, into the school year. Um, and of course, again, just wanna say, because as we're talking about um, meals and everything, are they able to wash their hands properly? So giving them those opportunities to, to, to wash their hands, put on the soap, wash for more, more than a couple seconds, making sure they're getting all in their fingers, just practicing that, that process at home as much as possible. Another self-help skill is that cleaning up after themselves. So if you can provide your child with um, practice and encourage cleaning up at home, if you can imagine a classroom that has 16 to 20 children in it and two adults and the children are actively and heavily engaged in play and then the play comes to the end, it's really important for children to learn to help care for that environment and make sure that they know how to put the uh, materials back properly and where to go and um, clean up after themselves. So at home, you can encourage your child to help put their toys away um, and take care of their belongings, like hanging up their coat. And then lastly, knowing how to ask for help. There, we know, we all know, these are our three and four-year-olds. They've only been on the earth for a short period of time. It's not expected that they can do all of this independently. So knowing how and when to ask for help is a really important skill for all of us. Um, so encourage your child to ask for help when needed, when needed um, whether it is with a task or even if they just need to, um, as Lauren mentioned earlier, earlier, naming their emotions. So even if they just need to be comforted by a trusting adult, it's okay to name that and ask for that. And then problem solving with a friend, anything that they need, if they have the words and the confidence to ask for that help, um, that's one of the best skills that, again, any of us could definitely benefit from. I'm going to pass it now back to Cheryl. All right, thanks Robin. Um, so we know that your child's health and safety is completely top of mind for you. Um, and it's absolutely our, uh, our top priority as well. So we'll spend a few minutes before we close out this evening, um, just talking about some, some health and safety items. So first, if you haven't completed your enrollment pa packet yet, uh, go ahead and do so. Um, and that as part of that packet, you'll be asked to complete several health forms, including the universal health certificate, which is where you'll document your child's well child care, um, immunizations, that type of thing. thing. You'll also be asked to complete a oral health assessment uh, from, their, from their dentist, a medication form if your child is on any medications that the school needs to administer during the day or needs to know about, and similarly, dietary accommodations. So if you have any dietary accommodations or your child has allergies that the school needs to know about or anything like that, uh, there will be forms there for you to provide them with all the details that they need. Uh, you'll also be asked to sign an authorized pickup form and that just identifies the, uh, the individuals, the adults who will uh, be allowed to pick your child up at the end of the day. So some of these policies we've already talked about, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. Um, as Robin and others mentioned, our pre-K children do eat breakfast and lunch in the classroom so they don't have to move around the building uh, throughout the day or eat in the big cafeteria with big kids and lunch becomes a really wonderful um, opportunity for conversation and engagement and getting to know each other and things like that. Um, I think somebody also mentioned the special subject classes. They are held in the classroom in our pre-K classrooms except PE or sometimes library. Like if the children are checking out books, obviously they'll go to the library 
um, to do that. But for their music classes and their art classes or any other special classes that happen to, during the day, those specialist teachers uh, come to the pre-K classroom um, in order to work with the children there. As you can imagine, moving a group of three and four-year-olds around a building is complicated and takes a lot of time. Um, so doing, doing these activities in the classroom makes sure that our, our littlest students are in an environment that's designed for them, a, a pre-K specific environment, um, and also saves a lot of time and just means that they have more time for play and learning and fun in the classroom. Um, we do have active supervision plans in place, so every pre-K classroom uh, will have an active supervision plan, uh, usually has your child's photo on it along with the child's name, so if there's a substitute or something like that, um, they'll automatically know who your child is and can account for your child, make sure that um, they know when your child is in the classroom and when they're not, and it also is something that helps the teachers just do a quick check and make sure at all times that every child is accounted for, so that's one of the ways uh, that our teachers make sure that our children are safe and supervised at all times. We can go ahead to the next one. And finally, COVID. I know COVID is still, unfortunately, a, a concern and something that we're all thinking about. Um, so similar to last year, masks will be optional at the start of the school year. I guess I, I should start by saying that our health team works very, very closely with DC Health um, and the mayor's office and is in constant guidance um, with the professionals at DC Health. Um, and so this could change. They're monitoring on a daily basis what the COVID situation looks like in DC. Um, and so if conditions change, our policies would change. For now, it is looking like uh, masks will be optional again as we start the school year. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we're looking forward to welcoming parents back into the building. That could change if COVID, the COVID situation changes, but right now um, we're, we're excited to be able to welcome parents back into the building. Um, your time in the buildings may be limited, unlike it was pre-pandemic. So um, principals may have specific protocols that they want parents to, um, to follow or protocols to make sure that we don't have too many people in a building, that type of thing. So there likely will still be protocols, but we do expect um, to have a more open policy than we did last year. Um, we do have PPE supplied to schools. Your child will have a, a paper mask available to them every day if they want it. Um, also cleaning supplies and things like that. Our, our teaching staff and our custodial staff are um, continuing to do increased cleaning and dis uh, disinfectant um, protocols and procedures. Uh, last year, all of our schools um, were outfitted with state-of-the-art HEPA filters. So they have uh, new filtration and air ventilation systems, which has been very helpful. Um, in, in limiting the spread of, of COVID within the schools. And as you may have heard last year in our pre-K classrooms, we did have a test to return policy where tests were sent home with families and they could test before coming back to school. Um, we are still awaiting official guidance for what that will look like this year. We expect that um, COVID tests will continue to be available uh, to families throughout the year, but I do anticipate that within the next week or certainly two weeks, we will have updated guidance on what that will look like. We can go ahead to the next one. All right, I will stop there. I'm sure we have additional questions in the chat that we will continue to respond to. Um, and if anybody would like to go ahead and come off mute um, and ask their questions, there's lots of folks on the line. We will do our, our very best to answer them for you. I think I see a hand up. Josh, do you wanna go ahead? Yes, this has been very uh, good. Thank you so much. Uh, quick question related to COVID. Um, my, this is my first child going to school. And if there's ever a time that my particular school says we got a asynchronous learning or something of that nature, what does that look like just in general? Because I have no idea. I just heard a term. Yeah, good question. Good question. Um, and so obviously in two years ago during um, school year 2021, we were virtual. We were learning asynchronously all the time. And we developed a lot of protocols and procedures and resources and things like that during that year. We continued that last year. So last year there were just a handful, really not a lot. Frankly, I was, I was, I was quite surprised at how few classrooms did have to close down at some point for a brief period during the year. When that did happen, those classrooms did shift into asynchronous learning. Um, the schools have a supply of iPads or small laptops that they can provide to a class when, uh, when a class does need to go asynchronous or go virtual. And teachers have a schedule that they are prepared to shift to. So at the beginning of the year, um, teachers will have that schedule ready to go. And what that generally looks like is children will have 
a few opportunities during the day to engage online with their teacher, usually with a small group. So what we learned very quickly in the beginning of COVID was having 16 to 20 children online for a virtual lesson at one time doesn't always work that well. And small group lessons worked a lot better. So what would happen if your child, if your classroom were um, in a situation where that they needed to shift to virtual for a brief period of time, you would get a schedule that said, please log on for at you know, nine o'clock for morning meeting, and then again at 1030 for a read aloud, and then at this time for a math lesson or something like that. So it's not all day long, as you can imagine, you know, three and four year olds just can't sit and attend to the computer um, all day long. So they need short opportunities to log on, do some learning and then run and play and then come back on. Um, and there's also a whole suite of resources that are available to parents. And so we can put in the link, I think our family toolkit now, which will give you a little bit of a taste for what some of those resources look like. Um, but resources were, were provided uh, to families as well, so that you were able to understand what are the skills that your child is working on in school and you can support those at home through really simple activities that you can do. You don't need to memorize a <laughs> lesson plan or get extra materials, but just tips that you can do to support um, your child at home while you're doing the dishes or making dinner or things like that. Um, so that gives you just a very general sense of what that would what that would look like if you were to be in a situation where your child's uh, class would need to switch virtual for a short time. Other questions? I have a question uh, about meal time. Um, so my child is currently not eating with utensils. Um, so if if they're not using utensils, um, does the teacher provide some guidance, or is it okay for them to still eat with their hands? I I think I'm going to let our expert, Ms. Massey, take that one. Ms. Massey, do you mind responding to that one? Um, I. I think it will depend on your individual child and their needs. And I definitely would communicate with the teacher early and explain, hey, you know, this is what has been going on at home. Um, what advice and tips and expectations do you have? Um, if it's just something you haven't introduced yet, I introduce it, see what happens. You know, it's good for fine motor strength um, and, and supporting fine motor development in kids. Um, if it's something that um, you're not quite ready to introduce, um, talk to your teacher about that and um, see, see what their expectations are in the classroom for your child. That'll definitely be kind of like potty training. That's those are things that you want to communicate um, frequently and often with with the teacher, and the teacher will be communicating with you on um, child's progress around those kinds of um, self help and adaptive skills. Thank you, Ms. Massey. I did I did just notice that we are now three minutes past time for so for those of you who do have to hop off, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, for joining us this evening. It was really great to see so many of you here. Um, you have our email address. Please feel free to reach out at any time. If you have questions or things like that, we will do our very best to get your, your questions answered quickly. And for those of you who still have questions, I know I can, I can um, hang out here for a little bit longer and I imagine some of my colleagues um, can as well. So please feel free to stay on and ask your questions for those of you who need to leave us. Thank you and have a great evening.